Hello, guys. Uh, can you hear me well? Yay. Or no? Yay? OK. Uh, so let's do a quick poll. Uh, raise the hands who are working in IT. OK. Um, do we have any lawyers here? One lawyer. Um, can someone raise a hand who has a fetish? <laughs> My fetish is people who are raising hands, so got that out of the way. Anyway, so my title in here is Hustler, uh, because that's what I do every day. Uh, but officially, I'm a sales lead at Bolt uh, at Adform. And uh, at Adform, we create software tools that uh, are being used by the media companies to buy or sell advertising online. Uh, online. Um, before that, I was working on uh, in creative agencies before that. Um, and I have uh, some background in web development. And I have a degree in physics as well. I like stand-up comedy, GIFs, and dank memes. And if you don't know what it is, I cannot blame you. So for today, I'll talk about how uh, human workforce was changed by technology throughout the history, what changes are happening in modern days. We'll go a bit deeper into some geeky part to, to actually understand the te technology behind it. Uh, and after that, I'll make some conclusions and economic reasoning behind it. I'll go straight ahead and say that um, inspiration for this uh, was this video by CGP Great called Human Need Not Apply. Uh, it's a great channel on YouTube. Uh, if you don't watch it, uh, I recommend you to subscribe. It's the best channel out there. So uh, let's begin and let's talk about mechanical muscles. So people are lazy or smart. Uh, so therefore, they always invented some tools to make our lives easier, uh, whether that was the wheel, whether that was domesticated animals, whether that was tractors who helped to plow the fields. Basically, technology helped us throughout the way to, to do stuff that we didn't want to do. One of the main changes hap was happening in the Industrial Revolution where textile workers have been replaced by technology. And fun fact, previously uh, it was thought that textile workers' job is irreplaceable by technology. But it happened, and yes, a lot of people lost their jobs because of that. It even sparked this movement called Luddites. Those were the people that actually crashed those uh, machines as a sort of protest because they were losing their jobs. So when we think about work automation, we imagine something like this. Uh, huge fields of robots uh, doing some very narrow specific tasks and doing it 24 seven. But of course it goes way beyond that. We already have Roombas running around our houses. We have cleaning uh, machines, we have dishwashers, we have um, 20 cash machines instead of 20 cashiers and just one person watching over them. So technology saves a lot of time for us and um, a lot of jobs that we don't even want to do. Take this example. It's a little tiny robot by a company called Push from Korea. And they just made this tiny robot that can click a button instead of you. Right? Pretty cool. I mean, I'm lazy enough to buy this stuff. But that's pretty cool. You go home, you just you can control it with your smartphone, and it clicks the button for you. So that's how far we as humans are willing to go. Of course, to understand that we will be losing our jobs very, uh, very soon, we probably imagine something this like this has to happen. Some humanoids have to be uh, invented that can do the same stuff that we can. Uh, Japanese were obsessed about this. They were doing it for a couple of decades already, and well. First of all, they had to teach them to walk, and it was not an easy task. So every time I see a robot failing to walk, uh, I cannot help but laugh, and I love this GIF. It just looks like an Irish guy on a Friday night. <laughs> Been a while, maybe I had some experience like that as well. Cannot blame him. Uh, but then there's Boston Dynamics, who created this robot, which is called Dog. It works on four feet, but uh, this guy, well, he has it coming. I mean, why would you kick it, right? So if there's this Skynet scenario where robots are taking over, well, this guy has it coming. <laughs> but of course, uh, presumably, he kicked it just to show that it's smart enough to rebalance itself and not, not fall down. It will be very useful uh, going into rubbles and uh, you know, uh, debris where people might be stuck after uh, you know, earthquakes or something like that. But the actual threat for people workforce is coming from guys like these. That's Baxter, a general purpose robot. It has two arms, it has brain, it has vision, it actually does cameras, 
but it can be programmed to do pretty much any stuff that two, cans, uh, two hands can do. Yes, it's working very slowly, but it's making steady progress, and well, he can do pretty much anything. He can pour your beer, he can tidy your clothes in a store, um, and well, this robot is not like this guy. Yeah? It doesn't get tired, it doesn't get sleepy, you don't need to motivate a robot, it just simply works, and it works 24-7. And actually, robots just cost a couple cents of electricity. Baxter actually costs less than an annual minimum wage in US. So of course, there's economic reasons to exchange these kind of guys with robots that, well, just work and don't complain. So if we look at the example, uh, what happened with car industry and horses, uh, it's a good example where we're heading. So for a long period of time, horses were being used for pretty much anything. They plowed the fields, uh, worked at the, you know, they, they, they uh, carried people around, um, they were best postmen, et cetera, et cetera. You were riding into battle with horses, but then car came along and it was able to do similar stuff more effectively. Its mechanical uh, muscles were more powerful, they were not getting tired, and therefore, well, uh, horse went out of jobs. And car industry is giving us a good idea where this is heading. So we have to talk about this. We have to talk about autonomous cars. And I know what you're thinking when you're looking at this funny thing from Google. You probably want to say to it, go home car, I'm drunk. <laughs> well, actually it's already possible. You can jump, just kind of slump drunk in this car and it would take you home. There are a couple more examples like this from Lexus or um, from Tesla, it's, it was pretty nice. I mean, they put in the sensors and it required only a software update for it to be able to use autonomous um, driving. So since uh, Google project of self-driving car, that's by the way uh, what it sees when it's driving on the car, it was involved in total of 16 accidents and uh, no of them, none of them were their fault. It was just people crashing into them. To be fair, actually, a couple months ago, uh, there was a tiny crash when a uh, Google car was driving really slowly and it just clipped a bus. Uh, so technically, it was a first car incident caused by, by an autonomous car. Elon Musk has said that uh, car is the new horse. Basically, any car that will not have an autonomous uh, driving will be owned only for sentimental reasons. And if you would look at the population of horses in US, it peaked in 1915. And you know what else happened in 1915? Model T, right? The first production car for available for masses. So wor horses did really lose their jobs because cars were able to do same stuff that they could do more effectively. Let's talk about mechanical minds. There is this term in English language, blue or white collar. So blue collar are those guys that earn money by moving their muscles. And white collars, those are basically lawyers or doctors um, who earn money by moving their brains. So for a long period of time, we were thinking that our brain is so unique and it's so powerful and it's so creative that it will never be uh, able to replace it. But then there's this thing uh, called Turing test. It's basically, um, a test to distinguish whether or not computer has some uh, behavior equivalent to an, or indistinguishable from a real person. And computers are already able to crack it. Could you guess the painter of this painting? Well, probably I gave it away. You might, you might say it's a Rembrandt, but actually not. It was done by a computer. Uh, it was actually a clever content marketing project in Netherlands by companies like Microsoft, ING, etc. They scanned a lot of uh, Rembrandt works, they turned them into code basically, and they were able to kind of see what are characteristic uh, uh, nose or eyes or ears of, the, of its paintings. They even went as far to check the brush height uh, of the painting, and they replicated that with a 3D printer um, and generated kind of a new Rembrandt painting. Right? And the outcome, well, I would say if you kind of uh, place it in a, in a gallery next to other Rembrandt works, you wouldn't be able to tell. And that would be a good example of how Turing test actually works in real life. So creativity is actually all about very um, kind of narrow few um, principles. 
I took this slide from a great video, video online, which is called Review of a, uh, sorry, Remix of a Remix of a Remix. It says that anything that we create today um, is basically a remix of something that was, has been done before. And of course, computers are able to do this copying, transformation, and combinations um, as well. So we already have artificial intelligence painters. Um, this was a piece, I think, that was did back in 1997. Um, there are more examples like that. There is uh, this script called DeepArt.io, and it can basically take any art and uh, put it on your photos, and the outcome of my holiday photo looks something like this. It, that, that's probably how it would look if uh, Van Gogh draw a picture of my holiday. Um, there are some other more funny examples like that. It, it can go pretty, pretty clever. Uh, the same can happen with books as well. Computers can already write you a new book for Harry Potter, but just with a style of Kafka, for example. Um, actually, a fun fact, Turing test was passed um, some time ago by a computer-generated poetry. So this guy just wrote a script that generates poems, and he was sending it to a poetry blog. Uh, and those guys were like, yes, we really feel your struggle and your vibe. Uh, so they went as far to actually print it in a book. So there you go, a computer-generated poem in a book. There are a lot of AI tools already in the market that can help you on, uh, in your kind of daily life in the office. So Narrative Science is a company that can crunch on numbers and provide clever insights what's happening with them. Text.io is a company that helps you to write better language um, with more empathy. empathy. Um, Conversica is an automated uh, program that can reply to your demo requests um, actually, fun fact, I wrote to them and they didn't reply. So not sure, maybe that it's not that good just yet, but at least they claim they can do it. Um, there are companies that can help to do uh, customer support automatically. So basically, that's pretty exciting. Um, is that working? I'm not sure. Basically, you can set a threshold. Uh, and if computer thinks he really uh, has an accurate answer, it would go automatically. If not, it would suggest for you to either edit it, personalize it, uh, OK, I don't see that. Anyway, you get the idea, probably. You can either edit it or just click Send, and that would be automated reply for your clients. Um, then there's this XAI program that um, helps you to find the right spot for your meetings. So you've probably been a in a situation when you have like three open windows for a meeting, but another guy has two, and then there's a meeting room to book, and everyone's sending back and forth until you agreed. Uh, so artificial intelligence can do that for you. And it can do that in a kind of very nice uh, text-based fashion. Companies like Adform um, use artificial intelligence to scan and understand the contents of the web pages. Uh, for example, there are n numerous pages generated every day, numerous articles. We feed that to artificial intelligence, and it can tell what it's about, and it can even tell us emotions. So for example, advertisers might not show some ads on content where some tragedy, tragedy happened or something like that. So I did a fun thing. Uh, I took Login's website and I checked what computers think about that. Well, it worked out pretty good. Uh, it says it has a positive sentiment. It's about computer geeks, uh, events, sports, and entertainment. So there you go. I mean, manually, it would be pretty much impossible to understand any, any article that's being generated in real time, but computers are able to do it now, uh, these days. Machine learning can even be used to predict the most unpredictable thing uh, in the world. And of course, that's this, Game of Thrones. Right, so uh, some German guys actually did a script of machine learning where they fed all of the books of Game of Thrones and all of the scripts of the TV clips, and now they are able to guess uh, at certain accuracy what's the chance for the person, uh, for the character to be dead. So, uh, sort of spoiler alert, I guess. This guy has it coming, right? Tommen has 96% uh, chance of being dead in the near future. You probably encounter AI every day in your smartphones. Everyone's doing that these days, iOS, Android, Windows. Even Facebook has its own M product, which is pretty cool. Um, it's actually a live Turing test because you never know if you're talking to a bot or to a real person. If a question you ask is difficult enough, the people would take over. If not, a computer just takes care, uh, takes care of that. Let's just hope it will not happen uh, to what happened to this guy in 1970s. 1990, sorry. Probably you heard something about Go in recent months. There was a b huge stir about this game, 
And even Mark Zuckerberg said that they're building an AI machine to, um, to play this game. And Go was the single game that uh, people were still better at than computer. Computers were unable to beat per, uh, humans. And Mark Zuckerberg, sa uh, Zuckerberg said that we're getting close. While at the same day, Google actually said they beat it and they had video to prove it on the same freaking day. I don't know how gutted Mark Zuckerberg had to feel that day. I mean, sorry for him. He probably felt worse than that guy who's, who's just got beaten. So computers were destroying people for, on random games for quite some time. Uh, Deep Blue uh, defeated Garry Kasparov in 96, 90, late 1990s. Uh, but why it's a big deal why AlphaGo defeated uh, the world champion at Game Go? To understand that, we have to look at the differences, how it was possible. So first of all, we have Deep Blue, that's the computer that uh, played against Garry Kasparov and AlphaGo. Uh, basically, differences in chess and game, uh, because the huge difference is that it's pretty hard to tell who's winning in a game of Go, and there are just too much uh, moves that can be made. So back in the late 1990s, uh, Deep Blue just simply used a deep uh, kind of brute force method, while AlphaGo was using deep learning, which is similar to how human brain works. So just an example, uh, if Deep Blue would be uh, used to crack a password, it would go and try every combination until, uh, until it get it right. So that means a lot of combina uh, combinations. For chess, it works. For Go, unfortunately not, because game tree complexity, that's the kind of uh, that's the number of how many moves there are possible and how many moves it takes to win a game is actually more than are, there are atoms in a visible universe. All right, so brute force just don't work. Therefore, deep learning uh, me method was used and it, if it cracked, uh, tried to crack your password, it would try your name, it would try your dog name, it would try your birthday. So only a couple of uh, options that seem kind of to make sense. So to understand the differences between bots, algorithms, machine learnings, and the actual artificial intelligence, we have to look at this uh, slide. Basically, bot is all about doing very narrow tasks and doing it repetitively and automating fashion. Machine learning is doing the same, but also tuning algorithm every time, so the machine learns from it. And artificial intelligence, basically, it's uh, machine smart enough to solve pretty much any problem. Um, that it hasn't encountered before. So when we talk about artificial intelligence, we have to talk about this guy, that's IBM Watson. It's a supercomputer that uh, works in this kind of com uh, cognitive computing fashion. It's similar to how human brains operate, and uh, its hobby is basically beating some very clever dudes on Jeopardy. Um, that, that's the answer, by the way. Keep, keep in mind these numbers, I'll explain what they mean. You probably can expect already, but I'll go in details explaining that. So Watson beat them pretty thoroughly. <laughs> I mean, and these guys were not some random dudes. They were champions before. Uh, Watson simply destroyed them. So how Watson uh, works, basically, mm, specialists have to feed a lot of data to the computer. Um, computer finds the correlation between the words, and it can figure out the, the rest. So in this case, well, they probably just fed the whole Wikipedia to, to Watson. But the actual appliances of Watson is in medicine and law. So if you think about uh, what doctors are doing these days, last time I was for a medical check, um, it, was, it took like 10 seconds and they were like, what's the problem? I have a headache. Um, do you have a temperature? No, take this, done. Okay, but I would like to go a bit deeper than that, right? And computer would be able to do that. It would be able to check my status from the Fitbit, from my iPhone. It would be able to check the correlations of similar body type of male in my country. Uh, it would be able to check what are the correlations between different drugs, um, between different medicines, sorry, <laughs> uh, that, that might take some uh, action, right? And doctors usually don't have time for that, while computer could make this decision really quickly and accurately. Same goes for lawyers. Um, if, you if you look at the, what lawyer is doing in his uh, random day of work, there's a lot of documents that have to be searched and read, and it takes a lot of time. IBM Watson can learn all those documents and help to find the right ones when they need it. A, a good example is actually, again, one of the hobbies of Watson. Um, it was trained to become the best chef in the world. So what they did, basically, they fed a lot of recipes for IBM Watson. 
it found the correlations between the different products, and then it was able to come up with new recipe of products that you have in your fridge. Right? So it did come up with some crazy ones like strawberry curry. It might sound awful, but it actually tasted really well. And that's just an example of how computers can be creative. People mind would never would limit itself in this box and would never think like these combinations might work. But computer noticed those patterns and they apply that. All right, so we heard these uh, artificial intelligence, deep learning. Um, so how does it actually work? The first time you would have to, uh, if you would look how it works, you will probably end up in a thing called neural network, and it will look something like this. Well, it doesn't make any sense. First time when I seen it, I was like, okay, it's, it's not really helpful. You have input, you have hidden, you have output, what it is. But basically, it's a uh, kind of attempt to replicate the human brain. Our brains uh, have billions of neurons that are connected with each other, with, uh, yeah, that are connected with each other, and they are passing electrical signals to each other, right? So that was the idea that, uh, again, Alan Turing proposed back in uh, early 30s. He said that there should be uh, possible to construct a computer that at first would be unorganized. Uh, it would spit out some random, random numbers but eventually you would be able to tune it by training it, right? So that's what, uh, that's what he proposed. Uh, and basically it says that you can't train computer to do any task, right? So it worked for some time, but actually um, back in the day, computation power of computers was not that great. And somehow this rule-based programming took over. So these neural networks were forgotten for some time. But now we probably heard of thing called Moore's Law, where well, just take this example. The most powerful computer in 2000 was a building. It cost $110 million, and it used six, uh, six megawatts of electricity. Well, these days you can get a GPU card that's this big. It costs uh, 1,000 bucks, and it, it only uses 300 watts. So eventually, the computing power came along, which was necessary for those neural networks to work. So to, to understand how they work, um, let's take a look at this table. It, it has random, uh, uh, <laughs> random uh, stuff in here. I'll just put it out of my head. Basically, we have age, we have income, we have education, we have sex. We, we might have some other information. And we know uh, the political views of that person. We can use machine learning or artificial intelligence to solve another question where we know all of these input information, but we don't know the output, right? So how would, would we do that? Well, first of all, we have to transform this information into numbers. So 41-year-old means 4.1, high education, that's 1. And female, well, there's either 1 or minus 1, um, at least in our country. So we feed that to, the, to these neural networks. And it does some really simple calculations at first. Some random weights are being applied, like 5, 0 0.58, et cetera. And at first, it would spit out some random numbers. It would be accurate. It wouldn't be accurate. But if you feed enough information and if you're able to train, that's by using this input information, right? Eventually, you would be able to tune this computer to give you the right answer with a certain accuracy. So there you go. If, let's imagine, this is trained already. So 0 0.73 would mean that it's 73% sure that this person would be a liberal, or liberal political view, right? Um, deep neural networks is basically a lot of these nodes with different weights attached. Just an uh, example, human brain has actually more than 100 billion of these neurons, right? So we're not really uh, <laughs> there just yet. The same goes for image recognition. Um, if you show thousands of cat pictures to a computer and saying that that's a cat, eventually from certain pixels and certain patterns, it would figure out, and the next time you show a new picture of a cat to this computer that it hasn't seen before, uh, it would be able to tell whether that's a cat or a dog. So that's how image recognition works on Google servers, uh, services like Google Photos. Um, and you've probably seen these, these uh, images which are called AI dreams. Basically, the idea was that um, people use the same technique, but they said, you know what? Tell, tell us what you see and change the image accordingly, right? And they do it over and over. So if computer sees some dog or, or a cat, it would emphasize it throughout the time, right? So that's, that's, that's how uh, <laughs> Donald Trump would look from AI perspective. 
So to understand this AI technology even better, uh, we can look at an example of how one guy trained AI to play Mario game. He actually did his thesis on it. Uh, it's available online, you can download it. It's pretty interesting read. Uh, but basically he wrote this little neural network. It's actually right there. These little lines are those weights that calculations are happening. This is what the computer is seeing, just some random blocks. At first, it has no idea what's happening. It has no idea what's the purpose. But when it's being trained, and uh, the function of the training goes something like this. Hit random buttons until your high score gets higher and higher and higher. Games are good for this because they have very strict rules and they have this high score. That means that anything you do right, you get a mm, kind of higher high score, right? So it took 32 generations for Mario to actually complete the first level. Uh, these flat lines say that, well, Mario was somewhere stuck. Uh, wrong keys were being hit and he was not able to advance. But once the right keystroke was hit, he was able to jump some obstacle, the high score went up, and that's how computer learned that this is the right thing to do. It actually really correlates with the, our biological evolution because that's how our world works. For billions of years, um, species that were unable to advance, they just simply died and went out of the gene pool, while those that were able to reproduce still go on. Happily, that's us, right? Um, so the same, same principle applied here. Basically, those keystrokes that were right and produced the higher high scores were multiplicated over and over and over to try and get this game right. And it went, uh, it, it became so good, actually, it even started exploiting bugs in the game. So in this section, there was this bug in the game where you could, was able to squish this uh, little Goomba, but it was just a one pixel jump. A person would never think about jumping here, but computer noticed that and they, and it started exploiting that. So again, it just proves how computers can be creative. Another example was uh, same principle applied on Tetris game. Uh, this one just one of the first generation while it was learning. So as you can see, it's not doing really good. Uh, it hasn't had time to be trained, but basically uh, he was doing this because he was getting one point for stacking an obstacle on each other. That's the worst planning that you can have to, for this game, but that's what he was doing. So when he got to this point, um, he actually did something amazing. He paused the game. Because the only way not to lose the game was not to play at all. All right, so let's make a conclusion. Um, we see that mechanical muscles are already here. Mechanical minds are also coming and they're able to see, they're able to hear, they're able to talk, they're able to think, they're even able to feel. So what does it mean for us? Will we be replaced by a robot? Probably yes. And that's a good thing. And I'll uh, kind of base my reasoning based on this book I wrote, so, uh, I <laughs> wrote, I read some time ago. I haven't written a book just yet. Uh, it's called Why Nations Fail. Uh, it's a really interesting book and I got obsessed by some ideas that are uh, in it. Basically, it boils down some factors why some countries are prosperous while some aren't. So there are some couple um, ideas why countries might be uh, kind of poor. Maybe it's due to climate, maybe it's due to geography or culture or, or religion. Let's assume, you know, it's too hot in Africa to build crops, so therefore to grow crops, so therefore they're poor, right? But uh, one of the most rich um, economies in Mayan culture was in the same geographical, uh, at least in the same kind of um, climate level. So actually it's not true. And a couple of factors behind it uh, are other ones. I'll explain them in a second. If you look at a um, couple of countries that are poor these days, you will see some patterns uh, appearing. You will see that there is an elite that's trying to remain at the top for as long as possible and capture the wealth of its common peoples. So actually, the factors to be for a country to be prosperous is this, inclusive institutions. Um, I will not go into details explaining what it means, but basically it means don't steal. And another really important one is creative destruction. So something has to be changed with something better for the economy to advance. This was happening in industrial revolution times. Yes, some jobs were destroyed, but it was replaced with a better technology. So economy went up and everyone was better off. So the same goes every day. I hear um, even from the clients I speak, 
I, I heard some ideas that hey, I would say, you know, you can sell your ads automatically. You don't need 20 people for that. Yes, but these guys will be out of job. Well, it might be that being out of job, it might work out well for them because they will adapt to some new ones. There are a few other uh, factors, but I will not spoil them right now. I encourage you to read that book if you're interested. So a couple of takeaways for you guys is, well, first of all, let's talk about Ludwig's fallacy. Basically, it's an idea that Ludwig's were wrong because if technology was taking our jobs away, shouldn't be all out of our jobs by now? We, st we still have them, right? So this technology um, replacing people was happening since the invention of wheel. And we still have jobs due to this fact, uh, compensation effects. While yes, technology can displace certain types of job, but that was the main factor how new jobs were created in the first place. And I like this quote online, um, the white color of a future is a hoodie, meaning that these guys that can program these computers and can build these m uh, mechanical minds, they are the new white colors. And if you would look at the top skills uh, of 2015 on LinkedIn, it's dominated by developers, data analysts, uh, data miners um, and similar. You don't probably see a lawyer there, unfortunately. So the main takeaway I have for you is we will adapt because we're such quick learners. Horses were unable to adapt because, well, they could only do a couple things well. We, with our minds, we are so uh, capable of adapting to new environment that we will always invent new jobs and technology will always assist us. IBM Watson has not become the best doctor, and it nor it ever will be, but it will become the best assistant for the doctor, and that's where technology is heading. The real threat, though, is that our educational system is not preparing us properly. We're still being trained as a very narrow specialists, um, and that's why I encourage you to invest in your own education and stay hungry for information, because if you don't, well, you'll become like this guy. You will pause the world. So don't pause it and keep on learning. Thank you, guys.